call the tax committee to order for March 5th. I agree. And I'm also going to call the property tax committee to order for March 5th. And uh, the other chair, Representative da uh, Dabney, will be here soon. He's running a little bit late. Members, I'm going to propose that we do these uh, eight bills in 90 minutes. It's totally doable. And otherwise, we have to come back tonight. And I am aware from a lot of people who have bills, both members, their testifiers, and lobbyists that folks, including my school district is one, um, schools were canceled. Many people are concerned about getting home before the next round um, tonight and are dealing with returning children, you know, taking care of children and things like that. So if we can do 10 minutes per bill, um, the, the process is we just hear them and lay them over for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill so no votes take place anyhow. So if that's acceptable to everybody, then we could be done. Um, at two and we would not come back tonight. So with that, looks like people are okay with that. Representative Dean, come on and join us. We will move your bill before us when we have the appropriate quorum, at, quorum to take the motion. So we don't yet, but if you could tell us about House File 606. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. There's also a technical amendment, author's amendment. And we'll move your author's Dean. amendment when we have a quorum to get in the order you would like it, but if you just want to discuss it as if we had amended it, then we're good to go. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members. The, the Bill 606 is for Compact Development District for TIF funding for that. And um, what it would do is allow TIF to be used for more specifically, uh, strategically, actually, within the transportation corridor. Uh, many of you are familiar with TIF um, and, and, and what it does. One thing that, that I, I think is critical about this is, you know, the, the current light rail line in Denver, Colorado, their southeast corridor costs $879 million to development, develop. It's 19.7 um, miles in length and has 14 stations. On the day it opened, uh, the TOD that had been completed construction or was under construction being permitted or in the preliminary stages of the planning totaled $4.25 billion. So it, it does have a huge impact on spurring private development. And it, it doesn't happen on its own. Uh, oftentimes, uh, transportation-oriented development is legal as a matter of right to build under the existing land use regulations. And as with in, infill redevelopment in general, site conditions can add significantly to project costs, particularly in the terms of uh, environmental re remediation. So private capital remains hesitant to lead the way to mixed-use forms of development, even though the market wants to move in the direction. And TIF plays sort of a, a, a priming to that pump to make it happen. Um, other regions, of course, use tax increment financing uh, very broadly, and uh, it supports transit-oriented development. Uh, and uh, Jim Merkel will, will be going through a PowerPoint here and, and pointing out some of those areas. And, you know, it's been used in the fat past to support transit oriented development in Minnesota, including Bloomington Central Station on Hiawatha and the Fridley Station on North Star. And what I'm going to do is turn it over to uh, Mr. Merkel now to go through this PowerPoint, which I believe should be in all your packets. So, Jim. Welcome, Mr. Urkel, please. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, my name is Jim Urkel. I'm an attorney with the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy, and I direct MCEA's Land Use and Transportation Program. Um, mindful of, of um, the, the time constraints, um, I'm going to whip through this as quickly as I can. But uh, transit-oriented development um, is really a, a mix of uh, housing, retail, and commercial uh, development and amenities, usually referred to as mixed-use development uh, in a walkable neighborhood with high quality uh, public transportation at, it, at its center. Um, it's, it, it, it happens along a, a lot of the, the transit lines that, that have been developed in the last couple of years. Um, Representative Dean um, mentioned one in, in Denver. The, the uh, Phoenix in, at, in its starter line, which opened in, in uh, 2008, uh, is 22 miles, no, 20 miles long, 22 stations within a quarter or within a half a mile of those stations. The day it opened before a single paraplane passenger walked on board one of the, the, the trains, um, they had uh, mixed use uh, forms of development um, either already constructed, under construction, going through permitting or in the preliminary stages of planning. Uh, for worth about uh, $6.1 billion. But as uh, Representative Dean pointed out, it, it, this doesn't really happen on its own. In a lot of these places, they have to have a, a number of tools uh, that they can use in order to make this work. 
Um, the, the Environmental Protection Agency uh, recently came out uh, with a report um, in, on infrastructure financing for, for TOD, uh, which lists out a number of those kinds of tool, tools, and it includes um, making uh, more use of uh, tax increment financing in support of transit-oriented development. Um, if, if you go to page five, you'll see that uh, doing these kinds of deals in, involves a lot of different people and a lot of different players and trying to put it all together. Um, um, the, the next page, um, page six, shows an example from Fruitvale uh, Village in uh, Oakland, California. Um, and it took them 13 different uh, funding streams to be able to put together the, 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 the transit-oriented development uh, pr uh, project. Um, that has really taken off and is really sort of a showcase for TOD from around the country. Um, I thought that was pretty good until um, I, I saw that uh, Mike uh, Tamale um, uh, had to use uh, more, more than 30 different funding streams in order to put up the King's Crossing Station at University in Dale um, on what will soon become the, the Central Corridor. Go to page uh, eight and nine. You'll you'll see how TIF has been used to support uh, transit-oriented development in a number of different um, uh, circumstances, um, different modes. If um, the the first one is the Mockingbird Station, and you can really kind of think of, of it as uh, what what you might see in the redevelopment of the Midway sh uh, Shopping Center on, on Central uh, Corridor someday. Uh, the Denver dry goods um, uh, example uh, below that is something that you might find in, in the warehouse district on, on Hiawatha. Uh, the Elmhurst station on the next page in Illinois, uh, commuter rail line, uh, um, and you could think of something like uh, Coon Rapids or, or Ramsey and how it, it might play out. And then uh, the Grossmont trolley station from San Diego uh, uh, looks a lot like what might happen down in Eden Prairie if uh, you could um, eliminate some of the, the the parking uh, spaces that are that are down there. Tip for Todd um, ha has moved forward in a number of different places. There are four states that, in the past 10 years, have established specific uh, TIF districts in order to support transit-oriented development: Pennsylvania, Texas, Maryland, and Maine. Um, and uh, the what uh, House File 606 would do would 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 be to um, um, put a uh, Minnesota spin on that and and uh, add to. Tiff uh, for Todd into the um, as, as another lure in the uh, tackle box for uh, uh, development uh, with, along with our transit planning. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Urkel, uh, Rep. Sam Dean. Further, anything uh, else you'd like us to know? It, nothing specifically. Um, certainly, we'll take a couple questions if you. We do we have like. time for a few questions? Do, do members have questions? Rep. Sam, run back. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Dean, uh, or maybe Mr. Urkel. You mentioned two cities where you envisioned this, maybe in Ramsey and um, and Eden Prairie. And I guess my question is, why? Why? I mean, really, would we start out in the suburbs? I mean, this is not more desirable and needed in the in you know the center cities. I mean, it just seems like you yeah. know why are we why are we wasting money in some ways uh, on the suburbs? Where, well, well, hey. <laughs> represent, Madam Chair, and Representative Ron Beck, Mr. Urkel, is a suburban legislator. Yeah, as well, uh, Representative, so. what, what this does is it actually allows it to happen along the lines. So it doesn't m force a city to use this as a tool, but it allows a city. So, for instance, the city of Ramsey could use this as a tool, or the city of Eden Prairie could use this as a tool, or um, St. Louis Park, or, you know, St. Paul, or, well, I guess Central Corridor is almost built out now, so that's not quite the same. So it really allows them to use this as a tool. It doesn't automatically give them the money, um, but it allows them to move forward. And, and Madam Chair, Runback, please. Representative Dean, um, then the funding is strictly within each city. I mean, a city would have to, to, to pass a, a resolution and pass, you know, all of that to get the TIF going in their city, so it's City by city? Perfect. Yeah, I, I, I believe so. It would have them. to be approved through, through, through the city itself. Okay. Thank you. Just to, maybe just a comment. I mean, it, you know, I think what we're, what these are best used for is economic development. You know, they're great economic redevelopment tools, not necessarily great for transit and moving people. Um, 
And so that's why I say suburbs really wouldn't be the first you know, priority in terms of where you would cite these because uh, you know, everyone may want them. And so you know, who comes first? Thank you. Uh, Madam Mr. Chair. Urkel, did you want to comment? Yes, uh, Representative. The, the, this wouldn't just happen in, in any suburb. It, it would only happen in a suburb in, through which a transit line, a qualified transit line would run. Those have been identified. Uh, the, the, they're part of the transportation policy plan for the Metropolitan Council. They're being funded through, with, with the help of the county's uh, transit improvement board. So we, we know where those are. It wouldn't just sort of happen. They wouldn't sort of just pick it up. And it would, it would carry on with the investment that the counties have already decided to make in, in the qualifying uh, transit lines. Okay. Is there anyone who wants to speak for or against this bill? If not, um, Representative Marcourt moves House File 606 to get it before us, and Representative Marcourt now moves the author's amendment, which is the 606A1 amendment, to get it in the shape the author would like it. Discussion on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. The motion carries. Represent Dean, thank you. And Mr. Urkel, we're going to lay it over for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill, and we appreciate you being here. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam. Thank you so much. And we're now going to call up Representative Hornstein. And Representative Simonson now moves House File 617. Representative Hornstein, do you have an author's amendment? Looks like you do not. No, I'm not going to. There was talk of one, but we're not going to. Okay, so this is for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill. And as more members come in, I'm just, and nice to see you, Mr. Mayor. We're going to, I'm just going to repeat, we are taking <coughs> 10 minutes per bill. We were intended to go tonight. We are going to adjourn at 2 and not come back if we can all stick to 10 minutes per bill because a lot of people have let me know in the audience that their kids' school was canceled or they have drives back, and I know the weather is going to get another round here, so we don't want to keep everyone here tonight. So we're going to do 10 minutes per bell, if we can do that. Um, Representative Hornstein, Mr. Mayor, welcome. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and I've kept my hour-long introductory comments down to about 30 seconds. Perfect. <laughs> um, and <laughs> members, this uh, uh, I really appreciate your hearing House File uh, 617. And this is, uh, it's similar to uh, Representative Dean's bill, but uh, we have a, a little much narrower focus on transportation improvement districts. Uh, this is all comes out of the uh, whole long history that the legislature have had and has had in terms of uh, studying value capture. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce uh, wanted a value capture study in the bill, transportation bill that we overrode in 2008. And some of the conclusions of that study were that uh, this form of value capture is one that the business community certainly had uh, uh, interest in. That was one of the conclusions of that study that the Humphrey Institute did, and we have members of the business community that will be uh, talking. But before we get to them, I'm very honored to uh, introduce our mayor, R.T. Ryback, uh, who's been an excellent partner uh, with us in developing transit and uh, has just done great work uh, in terms of uh, moving our city forward in this. So, Mr. Mayor. Welcome, Mr. Ryback. Nice. Thank you very much. Uh, we're here to talk about value capture. We're here to talk about transportation. But I'd like to start by talking about North Dakota, a topic on all of our minds. But I want you to think a little bit about being in the North Dakota legislature right now. I wouldn't trade places, certainly, if I were you. But one of the things they have the advantage of is in a, in a state that's growing, they actually have far more resources. And if you take that very simple philosophy, that's not rocket science. If you're growing, you actually have more resources. You stop and think about what are the tools that states and communities can use to really grow their tax base. And that's really at the core of what we're doing here today. The city of Minneapolis is growing. We're very happy to say we are now uh, seeing the beginning of a construction boom that we think will be continuing around the state, and that's a very good thing. But something happens if you grow and you don't have the resources, to, uh, or you don't have the infrastructure to do it. You can only grow so fast. Forty percent of the people who come downtown come by transit. And uh, making those investments has been critical. I mean, imagine, for instance, this morning, if we'd had 70,000 more people on the road. The fact that we've invested in transit has mattered. Well, now put those two things together. How could the city grow? How could we make investments in transit? And how could we not come back here with a tin cup every year and look at all that? And the idea is to say that as a mayor in the largest city in the state, we have to really look at taking our tax base and making strategic investments that will grow that tax base further. So, for instance, one way to make that investment, we believe, is to increase the transit capacity on Nicollet Mall and the spine that goes uh, up Nicollet Avenue and up Central. We also believe, for instance, if you're in Uptown, 
and you look at that Midtown Greenway where thousands of new housing units are built, as all of that tax base comes on, if we put transit improvements on that Greenway corridor, we could actually grow even more, bring more people in without making transit improvements. We actually believe the city now can move from 400,000 to 450,000 people without adding more cars to the street. Here's the point. The bill before you really allows a mayor and a local unit of government to make those decisions. To be able to say that if we make a strategic investment and capture some of that value along that line, that we could then bring much more in. Now as I talk about that, I also want to be very clear. Minneapolis is a shining example under the leadership that we've had over the past 12 years of saying we are going to be very restrictive on TIF. When I came in, into office, 15% of the city's tax base was under TIF. It is now 8%. That's not a mistake. That's not an accident, an intentional policy. The only places we've used it, I would stand up here or anywhere and defend. One was to take the second largest building in the state, the Midtown Exchange, the former Sears building, and bring 1,500 jobs in. The other was Colaplast. We brought 500 jobs that would have gone to another state. So that's the only times we used it. But here's how we'd like to use it if this bill passed. Take three buildings that are now being built along Nicollet Mall, uh, three different condominiums that are being built. If we captured the value off of that, we would be able to build a new transit line on Nicollet Mall, a streetcar or high occupancy bus. We have a federal grant to study both. But if we captured the value of those three buildings, we could build a streetcar line, and then it would take the intersection of Lake and Nicollet, which we are going to reopen with the Kmart, and al allow thousands of more housing units to be there. For them to take the streetcar to their job at Target, to make Target more competitive than Walmart, because you can take transit right to the front door. All this bill talks about doing is saying that the stewardship of a local unit of government should really be about that balance. When do you invest to grow the tax base? I don't believe in making these decisions unless you can prove that you can grow the tax base. And I have 12 years of record to prove that we've very been strong on that. But I do believe right now that there's a strategic opportunity we have uh, to make those investments. And uh, we would be sitting here a few years from now in even better shape than the North Dakotas of the world because we could be able to grow further. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Representative Hornstein, did you say you had others who wanted to talk? Yeah, We're I, down to five minutes left okay. for your bill, and we, we have, have a question from Representative Anderson. So please, I think we all know Mr. we, Troyer, want, we don't want to be here us. late tonight. Welcome, please. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, City of St. Paul strongly supports this bill. Uh, we've supported the concept uh, for a number of years now. Uh, like Minneapolis, we've been really responsible over a long period of time, frankly, with our with current TIF. We have a, a policy of staying under 10 percent, and we have. Um, this would just add an, a new tool to our toolbox, as, as others have said. And particularly along the Green Line Central Corridor, what we're seeing is uh, the investment in light rail is certainly adding a lot of value and potential to that corridor, but there are a lot of other infrastructure needs um, that, we're not, that we're not as easily able to, to uh, put online such as the need for more green space as we're building new density in the city, um, such as the need for additional uh, bike and pedestrian connections to the stations um, from these new developments. Those are pieces that uh, the, the value capture would allow us to, to move forward with. Uh, we're also really excited about the potential for ideas similar to Mayor Ryback in terms of future uh, transit corridors in the city. We're doing a streetcar study now and are, and are very enthusiastic about those possible opportunities. But uh, for the time being anyway, our interest is more directly along the line that we're already building uh, to be able to capture some of that value that we're, that we're already starting to see and put it in pu public infrastructure, not to subsidize developers, not to do other things that people have an association with, with TIFF about. Thank you very Can much. Let me get your name. Sorry. Councilmember Russ Stark of City okay, of St. Paul. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks for being with us. Welcome. I, I'll just... I'm good, Representative. Thank you very much for having me, at, Madam Chair. My name is Will Schroer. I'm a joint employee of the Minneapolis Regional Chamber of Commerce and the St. Paul Area Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I support and our, our members and our boards support this bill uh, precisely because of what the others have, have said. It's a tool uh, that we need and we need all the tools that we can get to compete with uh, peer regions. Councilmember Stark and I will share a quick story with you. We were in Salt Lake City last Monday. Uh, their mayor was showing Mayor Coleman around and showing off what they've been able to do. Uh, they've built a new two-mile streetcar line. 
uh, which has attracted at one end $450 million in new development. A heavy chunk of that is uh, a California developer who's bringing California capital to Salt Lake City and was so pleased by the, the climate that he found there and the infrastructure they're putting in that he's moving his development headquarters from California to Salt Lake City. Uh, we want us to enable that kind of a development here. Uh, we want to give folks the, the flexibility to build those streetcar lines, capture the value they help create, and then uh, create a place for other developers to come and bring capital to our town. Thank, Thank you, you for being here. Was it Mr. Schroer? Schroer. Schroer. Okay, so Mayor Rybeck and Councilmember Stark and Mr. Schroer. Schroer. Thanks for being here. And I think Representative Anderson has a question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Hornstein, because this includes bus rapid transit lines, um, obviously they, those can move at any time. So aren't we essentially saying that the entire city could at one point be a tax increment financing district since bus transit lines are mobile? Representative Hornstein. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Anderson, this is really focused on, on very specific corridors and districts. So the bill itself talks about uh, geographic it has some geographic boundaries for it, an actual district. So the, the bus line would have to go in a very specific um, geographic area. I don't know if the mayor wants to add. Yes. To Mr. Mayor, Thank you, Madam, Madam Chair and Representative. A very good question. We haven't, frankly, seen bus rapid transit the way it is said to be done here right. We've built bus lines that stop less, but the real way to do that, and we certainly are, are looking at that, is to do permanent improvements at the stop areas so that it cr cr creates the predictability for both the person wanting to buy their home nearby and wanting to also, also do the development there. So um, true bus rapid transit, the type that we would use to compete with, it, say, a streetcar idea or a lot or that, isn't something that you pick up and move. It's something that you really make a deal with the property developer and the, uh, the homeowner on. Now, there are some cases where you don't do that, but in those cases, I would strongly say that people shouldn't use uh, value capture along that. It should only be done when there's a direct correlation to in increasing the property tax base. Thank you. Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Maybe it would be better, though, if, if there was some definition around bus rapid transit, because as I see it now, you could move the bus line any way, any time that you wanted to, and essentially you could have the entire city of Minneapolis as a transit uh, uh, tip district at some point. Um, Madam Chair. Representative Hornstein. Uh, Madam Chair and Representative Anderson, there is actually a uh, definition of bus rapid transit in state statute. This occurred in a, a bill that Representative Holberg and I co-authored in 2003 that enabled the study of bus rapid transit on 35W. And as Mayor Ryback said, there is nothing in the state of Minnesota that resembles the definition that we have in statute. So I'd like to see us actually start building bus rapid transit lines according to that definition. So um, you're absolutely right about that, and, uh, and we do have that in statute. Okay, and thank you. We're going to lay over House File 617 for possible inclusion of the Adams Tax Bill. I think Representative Anderson's got a point there about how we, as we go forward working on this bill, change or get some definitions beefed up. So okay. thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate you being here. Thanks so much. And Representative uh, Liebling now moves House File 706 for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill, and that's Representative Nelson's bill. And as he comes down, Representative Nelson, do you need Representative Liebling to move the A1 amendment to get your bill in the order you would like it? Yes, that would be great, please. Okay, so Representative Liebling moves the A1 amendment for possible or for to the House File 706. Discussion to the amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. So uh, the, bill, the amendment passes. So we now have House File 706 in the order that you would like us to hear about it. And Representative Nelson, I don't know if you caught this, and Ms. Nauman, we're going to spend 10 minutes per bill because we were going to come back tonight, but due to the, snores, the snowstorm that's supposed to repeat, uh, we have a lot of people whose kids were held out of school today, and we're going to try to adjourn on time with all of these bills done. So Representative Nelson. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and it's my intention to get this done quickly because I'm also supposed to be down in another committee presenting a bill. So um, I have Patricia Nauman here, and she will describe the bills and what, what the 706 does, and I also have a uh, gentleman from um, my city of Brooklyn Park come down and testify. Excellent. Ms. Nauman. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair and members, Patricia Nauman, I'm the Executive Director of Metro Cities. We represent cities in the seven-county metro region. 
Um, and I'm here today to speak both on our behalf as well as the League of Minnesota Cities behalf and support. And if it's okay, I'll speak in support of both bills that Representative sure. Nelson has and then turn it over to the two city officials that we have here today. Uh, House File 706 is um, an extension of what was called the 2010 Jobs Bill. Uh, which provided some flexibility in the use of the TIF statute temporarily to allow uh, spending surplus increments in existing TIF districts to be used for new construction or substantial rehab uh, in, for the purpose of creating jobs. Uh, these provisions were extended in 2011 for one year and they were also included in the uh, vetoed tax bill last year for an additional extension. Uh, because that bill was not passed, these, uh, this provision did sunset on December 31st of 2012. Um, these provisions do have provided and would have the potential to provide some important flexibility for cities, uh, but the deadlines have been, uh, frankly, a challenge for many projects, uh, partly due to the fact that land acquisition takes time, uh, the economy has been very challenged, and uh, the lingering effects of that. So I do want to speak in support of that, uh, this bill in front of you, and um, I have a couple of, we have a couple of city officials here today that I will introduce, but in, in the interest of time, I'm also going to speak in favor of House File 707, which is also adding flexibility to uh, the TIF statutes by extending the five-year rule to 10 years, which would allow for additional time in spending in increments uh, inside a TIF district once it is certified. And this uh, idea was brought forth to us by our city officials over the summer in the interest of providing some added um, time because of the economy and, again, the challenges that this has had um, in getting projects um, accomplished on time. So I have with uh, me today here Jason Arswold from the City of Brooklyn Park and Ryan Schroeder from the City of Cottage Grove, um, and I'm going to give them the seat that I have. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nelson. Rep. Sam Nelson, is, are either of your testifiers speaking directly to 706? Or 707. Uh, Mr. Arsfold's going to speak to 706, and he'll be 707, so he can do okay. so. So we'll take your testimony, then we'll lay this one over, and then we'll start up on 07. So welcome. Thanks for being here. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Committee members, my name is Jason Arsvold. I'm the Community Development Director for the City of Brooklyn Park, and I'm also a member of the Economic Development Association of Minnesota. And here to talk in support of this bill uh, on behalf of both entities, but I wanted to spend a little time talking about uh, what this has meant for the city of Brooklyn Park and some of the things we've been able to accomplish because of this in our city. Uh, we've been able to do a lot of things, but you know, one of the things that, that's been very important to us is we've, we've taken a vacant warehouse now and converted that into a high-tech medical manufacturing facility. And for us, that's, that's a really big thing to use, reuse some of our existing industrial buildings. And that's been a theme throughout this for us that this flexibility has allowed us to do. You know, we, we modernized another building uh, that had been perennially vacant and able to upgrade that with a modern fire suppression system. And in, in doing that, that building was able to be fully leased. It wasn't, able, it wasn't attractive for lease without that. We've been able to get that fully leased. That's meant a lot for our industrial areas. We had another building, uh, or another business, I should say, a local business in the community that had outgrown its existing facility, found another one in our city uh, that allowed it to, to uh, uh, expand its operations and we were able to help modernize that building in order to do that. Uh, and, that and the building that they left behind was immediately purchased by another business. So it's been really a really successful thing for us in, in that sense. And then something that um, you know we could have only done with this flexibility is to help one of our very visible struggling uh, retail centers reposition and, and fill it up with tenants uh, and beautify the neighborhood. And so that's been something that uh, you know, we don't always think of, uh, you know, with, the, with these kind of things, but it's meant a lot for the community and the surrounding neighborhood that goes along with that. And with these projects, uh, I know everybody likes the numbers that goes along with these things, but we've been able to invest $760,000 uh, of this existing TIF money, but we've, we've been able to leverage $6.7 million in private investment, and that's been a, a big deal for our city, particularly in the last couple of years. And along with that, there's 365 full-time jobs uh, full-time permanent jobs, these aren't just construction jobs that are associated with these projects, and retained 43 more in our community with the business that was able to relocate. So it's, it's meant a lot for us and it's been a big deal. Uh, you know, and, and the numbers here are great numbers for our city, but having this flexibility has allowed us to address our particular development objectives in Brooklyn Park, which is that we have a lot of existing buildings that are older, they need modernization, and this has allowed us to do that. And on every occasion of the project I just mentioned to you, there's been a larger impact in the surrounding commercial and retail neighborhoods that uh, these projects have been able to affect. And so our hope is that we can continue to do that with this extension and, and we know that we can with projects that we have in the pipeline. Thanks. Thank you so much for your testimony. I appreciate you being here. Members, we're going to lay this one over for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill. 
And Representative Lilly now moves House File 707 for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill. And do we need an amendment? No. Okay, so the House File 707 is before us. Welcome to the committee. And Madam Chair, we have Ryan Schroeder from Howdy Pro. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, members, uh, I am Ryan Schrader. I'm the City Administrator for the City of Cottage Grove. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to take a few minutes of your schedule. Uh, I'll try to uh, shorten up uh, some of the comments I was going to make. Uh, some are just kind of general policy and some are specifics. Uh, since 1970, as you all probably know, there have been seven recessions uh, that we've all experienced, and regrettably, I remember them all. Uh, I've been in this field for most of those. Um, while most of the uh, recessions uh, you know, have been uh, fairly brief, a couple, uh, that in 73 and 75, and another one in 81 82, and the most recent have been a bit longer. But all, in our experience, in the experience of the city of Cottage Grove and looking at our files and past records, uh, all have been terminated, the recession, recessions have been terminated by an immediate uptick in uh, construction activity. Uh, this uh, most recent one, we're not uh, realizing that same uh, result. Uh, in fact, this last uh, recession, uh, including the time since that, uh, the 2007 to 2012 time frame, our construction activity is down 70% uh, from what uh, we've experienced in the last, uh, in the previous 35 years, including those periods of time uh, where the other six recessions uh, have uh, occurred. Uh, in the field of facilitating and creating economic development opportunities, of course, you know, a lot of the heavy lifting is, is occurring at the municipal level, and uh, I'm here to uh, reinforce that um, uh, with this uh, current economic uh, climate, uh, we need as much flexibility as we can get, more flexibility than we've required in the past, because this recession and the recovery since the recession is in fact different uh, than what we've uh, experienced in the past. And frankly, we would be in support of all three of these bills, House Files 706, 7, and 732, uh, because they provide uh, some flexibility that uh, uh, is necessary in order for us to continue to uh, contribute to the economic recovery uh, in this state. Uh, for our purposes, uh, uh, the, the bill expansion that allows for uh, extension of the construction date and extension of the uh, completion of construction in that jobs bill is what's important to us. The flexibility for the you know the extension of five and uh, four and five and six year knockdown, while that's a good public policy, we believe that doesn't actually impact our particular situation. In our case, uh, what we're uh, attempting to do is redevelop a, a commercial property that has been vacant since 2007. Uh, it's a, a big box property. We've been trying to put it back into uh, production uh, since 2007. We almost had it uh, last time around uh, with the uh, past jobs bill, and we're probably within a month of uh, uh, pulling it off, but we just plain ran out of time. Uh, uh, so we're looking for an opportunity for us and for cities sit similarly situated to us uh, to, to get some time back on the calendar so we can take another run at it. In our case, uh, we would be able to leverage uh, public investment to private investment on like a, an 11 to 1, 11 private, uh, $1 public, and uh, we would create a couple hundred jobs. Uh, we believe that there's probably similar stories out there elsewhere, uh, but we'd ask uh, for your support. Thank you for your testimony. Are there further, uh, is there further testimony for or against this bill? Okay, questions? No? Okay, we're going to lay over House File 707 for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill. We really appreciate people clocking through these so that folks can travel tonight. Representative Newton, uh, so if, if Representative Carlson moves House File 732 for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill. And Representative Newton, I'm just trying to see if you have an author's amendment. Looks like you do not. Yeah. Correct? Okay, great. So welcome to the committee. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, um, 
have a question on the bill before I start, whether you would lay this over or whether it would go to the floor. Uh, we never send anything to the floor here. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not true. Silly question. <laughs> yes, no, nobody's going to get okay. a special push forward above any other TIF bill. Okay. So thank especially you, Representative a, Anderson. Especially a freshman member that hasn't brought in anything. Brought yeah, anything right. <laughs> and I'm, kind of a, I'm a rehash freshman. <laughs> Representative uh, Newton. Thank you, please. Madam Chair. This uh, bill essentially uh, extends the uh, TIF district for, we thought it was going to be for Coon Rapids, but with the advice of Mr. Michael, we've extended it for all, uh, all communities that are in the same boat from um, the uh, current expiration uh, to uh, 31 December 2016. And the reason for this is uh, in Coon Rapids, as in other cities, a lot of us were caught with having developments uh, started. We uh, cleaned up a, a, a big brownfield in Coon Rapids that had uh, a dry cleaner, cleaner that was uh, leaking tetra carbon tetrachloride, a uh, gas station that had been removed and the, the uh, tanks were still in the ground, it was leaking, uh, an old shopping center that was taken down and in the process we found out that the city for many years had used that as a dump for oils, paints and so forth. So the city of Coon Rapids went through extensive cleanup to get this prepared for development. We had a developer come in with a major housing project and, uh, and then the housing uh, disaster hit. And so the project was never started, uh, thank goodness, because that area would probably look like Aleppo right now with a lot of holes in the ground and partial buildings. So what this does is it gives cities some more time, especially those cities that were in, in the process of development and had already started on a TIF district, to continue their project and see it through to the end. And I have Mark Novinsky from the city of Coon Rapids here to testify. Welcome, if you have Mr. Any Levinsky, questions. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, as as Representative Newton said, our our project we had a contract inked, and the developer uh, came to us and and said, and this was about oh, late 2006, early 2007, and said, you know, we really don't like the direction the housing market is going. We think we might wait a year or two, and uh, that just completely sunk our, our ship. Obviously nothing has, has happened on this particular site in Coon Rapids. Um, and we really aren't seeing a lot of new development uh, in our city. We're a fully developed city. Uh, we are seeing a lot of our, our older housing stock turn over to rental. We don't have a lot of interest, quite frankly, even in the apartment market, which other sectors of the metropolitan area are seeing. Um, <coughs> And so we're thinking that it's going to take us a little while yet before we start getting enough market interest in our community to uh, move this project forward. And we certainly don't want our, uh, our tax increment district to uh, expire or uh, the city to miss out on funding opportunities for either this site or anything else um, because of, uh, because of the, the recession. So um, we're certainly hoping that, uh, that by extending this out um, to 2016, that uh, the market will come, uh, come around and uh, we will be able to uh, take advantage, capture some of the increments coming off that site, and then continue to uh, promote redevelopment along Coon Rapids Boulevard and in, in other areas. And as Representative Newton said as well, uh, this isn't probably a problem exclusive to Coon Rapids. I think there are a lot of communities that, um, frankly, were just, just uh, you know, everybody was hoping this was going to be a much shorter recession than it was, and clearly it wasn't. So. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you for your testimony. Mm -hmm. Furthers who'd like to speak for or against this bill? Okay. Question. Madam Chair, yes, could Rep. I Sembron ask Beck, please. a question of the city official? Yes, please. I, mean, I, I drive up and down Coon Rapid Boulevard every now and then. And my question is, had we not built the, the North Star commuter rail, would there have been possibly a, a light rail transit along Coon Rapids Boulevard? Mr. Levinsky. Um, uh, Madam Maybe Chair. Would really have benefited. <laughs> Madam Chair, Representative, um, you know the the North Star commuter rail is is uh, it's probably best not to confuse that with light rail. North Star is commuter rail; it's heavy rail, and it's, it runs on Burlington Northern's lines. Um, uh, light rail would would require a completely different line, and um, I don't believe that there was any plan or or any talk of ever locating light rail along Coon Rapids Boulevard. Um, the 20 years or so that it took to talk about North Star and get that moving had always been focused on the Burlington Northern line, to my knowledge. Representative Ronway? 
Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We're going to lay over your bill for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill. We're not going to send it to the floor, but thank you, Representative Newton, for <laughs> being you, here. Madam Chair. And we appreciate that Mr. Levinsky joined us. And now Representative Mack is going to move House File 775 for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill. And Representative Mack, it looks like you don't have a author's amendment. So with that, Representative Mack. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, I will be very brief and just introduce my testifiers in the interest of time and uh, they do a phenomenal job of explaining the project. So uh, this is uh, Mayor Mary Heyman Rowland from the City of Apple Valley. All right, thank Madam you. Madam Mayor, Mayor, welcome. Nice thank to see you. you. It's nice to see you as well, uh, Madam Chair and uh, members. Um, thank you for allowing us to speak to uh, House File 775. Again, my name is Mary Heyman Rowland. I'm the mayor of Apple Valley. Uh, I have been so for the last 15 years. With me today, I have um, our, our um, develop, community development director, uh, Bruce Nordquist, and I also have Tom Lowell with us as well. It's a rare occasion that the city of Apple Valley will come before you for special legislation. We are judicious and thoughtful about the use of our public resources and, and we want uh, to complete a job producing effort starting in 2012 uh, session that we began. For several years, the legislature has focused on job creation and we applaud your efforts to help create um, jobs throughout the, through the use of uh, value capture. So why are we here? As presented in the handout materials that you're going to be receiving, we have a problem that requires your assistance. Using special laws in place, we were able to initiate one of the two job and career creating projects. Uh, to complete the other, we received a broad legislative support last year and we need the time and the tools lost due to the 2012 omnibus tax bill veto. We're asking for your support for House File 775 to extend our ability to use the provisions of the previous special jobs bill legislation one more year to finish our work on the second project. Your assistance will enable us to develop 100,000 square feet of office that attracts a, will attract a major employer to downtown Apple Valley and over 500 business services and headquarters jobs. The project is not speculative. The company has committed to this growth and we have tools in place to assist. So what will the value capture provide us? It'll finish work started last year with a broad legislative support. It'll develop construction and permanent jobs. It will locate those jobs adjacent to Cedar Avenue bus rapid transit line, which has those fixed assets that uh, Representative Hornstein said he would come out and look at. It offers new local job location choices for 24,000 daily Apple Valley commuters and it facilitates economic growth in a fully developed region. It recognizes the considerable time required to actualize complicated development projects and it demonstrates the required but for importance of the resources. But for the extension, a large job producing office building will not be built. built. I thank you for consideration. I also want to uh, say to you that uh, staff has a summary of the information with regards to the numbers. And Mr. Lowell, Mr. Nordquist, and myself are available for questions. Thank you so much, Mayor uh, Heyman Rowland. Did you also want to testify on this bill? Yes. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, committee members, I am here only for questions because I have to honor your 10-minute rule. Yes. 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 OK, perfect. So are there que further testimony on this bill? Any questions? If not, we're going to lay it over. Repre Representative Dabney, sorry. My, my apologies, Madam Chair. Uh, Mayor, Madam Mayor, where is the company that wants to build this office uh, building located currently? It would be considered Central Village West, which is within the quarter mile of the BRT. Representative Dabney. And do you, do you know that area? Uh, Cedar Avenue, if you cross over County Road 42, you'll come to 157th, you'll turn east, you'll head east, and it's just within that area. Okay, Madam Chair, my eyes glazed over at a certain point there. Um, but the point is, it's relocating within Apple Valley. Absolutely. Is that on? Yeah. Yes. Okay, that's. Yes. 
Thank you very I much. You were asking me for specific, uh, specific locations. Yeah, you, 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 you could, uh, you could work part time as GPS. You were great. Don't <laughs> I, get me I'm wrong. Good at that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so with that, that, we're going to lay over House File 775 <laughs> for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill. And Representative Mack now moves House File 776 for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill. Representative Mack. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I will again defer to um, our, our experts. Let uh, Mayor Mary Heyman Rowland testify on this. Um, and we also have um, Eliza Fisher, who uh, is available for questions if anyone has them. Okay, thank you. Mayor Heyman Rowland and Ms. Fisher, please. Yes, welcome. Madam, thank you again, and Madam Chair and members. Uh, one specific 455-acre area is undeveloped in Apple Valley with active sand mining and gravel mining underway. The material mined from this area rebuilds our regional roads, our bridges, our international airport runways today, our infrastructure that makes our goods and services and our businesses go. This is a large vacant area under a private ownership, uh, Ms. Liza Fisher, or, uh, Fisher Robson, who is here with us today, and it's the it's one private owner that is closest to the Twin Cities and less than, less than 15 minutes from the International Airport. Apple Valley is an innovative city. It was planned as a community for 50,000 people and in a 17 and a half square miles, which is dense. We need an area to have people can live and work. The designated areas that we're talking here are two city guided segments for high quality mixed use business campus setting for economic and environmentally sound places to live, shop, and recreate with con connections to neighborhoods and adjacent downtown. I'd like to summarize our development objectives. In the 270-acre active mining area envisioned as a mixed business campus, the estimated number of jobs created in, is a range from 7,600 to 9,300 and approximately 2.7 to 3.2 million, million square feet of, redevelop, of development. In the Greater Mining and Recreation Project area, House File 776 assists in addressing an estimated 50 million in front end costs related to major road improvements, utility installation, stormwater management, and structured parking solutions in the highest intensity areas of the project. Public financing tools such as House File 776 leverages large amounts of private investment. We've proven our success in the partners, especially with the Fishers, and on a smaller scale in the past, and at a location which uh, is now called uh, Fisher Marketplaces, which is one of the, has some of the top ten producing uh, places in the United States. Liza uh, Robson, the landowner, and Jim Casterly are here. And uh, Liza, you have uh, some testimony. I'd like to turn it over to you. Welcome to the committee. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for listening to us today. Um, you know, the crux of the matter is, is that as much as my business um, does well on its own, we don't have the kind of resources being a small business for the kind of infrastructure that this property is going to take. 500 acres is just phenomenal for a business my size. And so we ask your help, um, and that's what we're here for, and we're open for questions. Thank you. Other testimony for or against this bill? Mr. Casterly, did you want to throw in here? Madam Please. Chair, I, I would just point out that uh, some way go behind that uh, consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds. But uh, this legislation has been before you before. Uh, the bill from Savage was heard two weeks ago. It was in the omnibus tax bill uh, several times. And um, the Senate is taking a different approach, which we can also live with. It does, we can work within those criteria. So we really appreciate your uh, hearing this bill today, and we do hope you will consider it. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Further testimony for or against this bill? Questions for Representative Mack? If not, we're going to, Representative Paymar, please. Uh, Madam Chair, so what rules are being uh, set aside here? Mr. Uh, Representative Kamar, did you want to have Mr. Michael? Kind of, Mr. Michael, and I, there's the, the bill summary, I think, is the best piece people should look at for House File 776. Mr. Michael. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Kamar, and members of the committee, what 
essentially what House File 776 does is in terms of deviations from the general law TIF rules is as suggested by the bill summary there are three major categories this area is a large uh, sand and gravel mining area and what the bill does is allows this area to be to, or allows the city to create redevelopment tax increment districts within the designated area in the bill and under general law you can only redevelopment districts are restricted to areas that are improved by a, a high proportion of buildings the law requires 70 percent of the parcels to be occupied by buildings or other improvements and that half of those buildings need to be substandard so in other words it's a tool that's designed to eliminate sort of blight and as represented by substandard buildings what this bill does is says that even though this is unimproved land in the sense that there aren't buildings on it it's improved in the sense that it's been mined that uh, the the city can create redevelopment districts on this in this area absent this the only thing that the city could could do would be to either create a soils district which is very restrictive in that it's intended to be used to clean up contaminants and hazardous waste and so forth or could use an, an economic development district and the big difference between an economic development district and a redevelopment district it's eight years of increment versus 25 years and the only thing you can use economic development for manufacturing research and development and telemarketing and that's not what they have in mind here the second thing that the the bill does is that under the general tax increment law there are restrictions on what are called pooling so in other words if you collect increment from one tax increment district the city has a percentage limit that applies that restricts how much of the increment it can take from that district and spend elsewhere in the city the city here is or the proponents of the bill here are saying grant us an exception from that provided that we spend it all within the area that's designated in the bill so they could collect increments from one part of this area where there may be a very intense development that will generate a lot of taxes a lot of increment and spend it elsewhere because that may be where the public the roads are or the other improvements that they're going to make so that's the the main other thing and the way the pooling restrictions are really enforced is through what are called the what's called the five-year rule which you heard in representative Nelson's bill they want to extend that to 10 years that says to a city you have a finite amount of time in which to complete your spending and when you're done with that you have to use all your increment to decertify the district so it goes back on the tax rolls and expands the tax base uh, representative Nelson's bill said hey extend that from five to ten years give us twice as long this bill says in this as long as we keep spending increment in this area give us uh, you know essentially exempt us uh, from that restriction so those are the three basic things that they're asking to deviate from what they could do under general law Sheriff some I, I have nothing the project sounds wonderful I just think maybe we should get rid of all the tip rules and <laughs> well, we'll go to Representative Laffer. I, I will just say, members, you know, just to just to remind folks, we have about 2,000. Maybe it's down a little. I think I was reading the state auditor report. 1,800 TIF districts, maybe, and every one of us represents a district that has TIF districts. There isn't a single legislator that doesn't. And in fact, we have multiple kinds of tax increment financing that's legal under law right now that our city council members pass without ever coming here. In fact, the overwhelming majority of TIF districts are just done locally. They only come here when they would like a special preferential treatment that no one else gets. And I will tell you, historically, it's the House who's really reined this in. These are property tax increases is what they are. And um, the House generally, no matter who's in charge, hears 15 or 20 of them a year and says no to most of them. So I think the House has been pretty thorough in vetting out <coughs> what this means because they are subsidies that come from property taxpayers and the city council members love them because they leverage the county tax base so they get their city tax base plus the counties so there's a lot going on here and why cities ask for them but you know historically we don't say yes to a lot of them and we don't hear that many of them 
So in, when you think about it in that perspective, Representative Paymer, I'd say that you know most cities just count, or just follow the rules that we've laid down, and the pieces that Rep or Mr. Michael was just talking about demonstrate really a lot of bipartisan hard work that um, you know former former state rep now Senator Rest and former Representative Abrams worked very diligently to rein in a lot of these subsidies, and so people come in and want an exempt an exception. So. I'm glad you asked the question because it allows members to, to go back up out of individual bill authors and think about what is TIF at its core and how much do we really want to pass on exceptions uh, given that this is all already a significant tool for cities. And Mr. Michael, can you tell me about how much uh, value is in TIF district in the state right now? Do you have a, can you guess at that number? I know it's been in the auditor's report. It's it's significant. That's off the tax rolls for the new captured value. Do you know, Mr. Michael? Uh, Madam Chair, I, I I do not know what that number is. The I, it, the calculations in tax increment are made on tax capacity, which is the product of multiplying value times class rates less the original tax capacity, and it. In general, it's over 200 million of tax capacity that's captured, but in terms of turning that into market value, I suppose you could divide it very roughly if you assume most of it's commercial and industrial. If you divided that by 2%, you would get probably a ballpark idea of the amount of value. Uh, so it's probably on the order of 4 billion or something like that. See, now, and I was going to guess about 2 billion. So it's good for tax committee members to just think about how much tax basis off the rolls for a while as people put that base into their prop these developments instead of either uh, paying for city services or county services or cutting people's property taxes. That would be a different option. So it's just, I'm, I'm glad you actually brought it up because it allows us to think about it again. Representative Loeffler had the next question and we do have one more bill. Representative Loeffler. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I thought, well, we were waiting for Representative Erdl to come. And since we're learning this, and this is the third gravel pit bill we've seen, could, I'm wondering if Mr. Michael could explain to us how do we assess the value of a, a gravel pit, because that really sets the value um, on which then you capture it. I mean, I don't know if it's low or high or if it's based on the minerals within it. Or Do we have Rep Sir, or Mr. Michael? We, do we know? <laughs> Yeah, the tax night guy next to him talking yeah. to him about <laughs> mining. Uh, Mr. Michael. Or not. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Loeffler, I, you're way out of my area of expertise. <laughs> I don't know how ap appraisers and assessors determine what the, I mean, as Representative Anselk was correctly telling me, it's whatever somebody is willing to pay for it. But I don't know how they estimate what somebody's willing to pay for it. Uh, you know, maybe. It doesn't look like there's an assessor here, so I'm yeah, we're all looking assessor. for the Department of Revenue to tell us. Uh, but Mr. Anzels, and then uh, Representative Anzels, and then Representative well, Leibling. Oh, I'm sorry, Representative Loeffler has a okay. follow-up. Well, well, thank you, Madam Chair, and I think it's important for us to kind of follow that up since it seems to be a big topic this year. <laughs> Just because if you're planning a redevelopment, you have to figure out what your costs are going to be, and then you know if we give authority for 25 years or you know 30 years or 10 years, I mean we just don't have a, a sense of you know, is this you know, going to extend 20 years past fully covering all the costs of, that they want for fire hydrants and sewers and you know, everything else? And you know, so you, you know, it should be in proportion in some, some way. Thank you. Representative Anza. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Madam Chair. Um, just for uh, your information, a ton of taconite sold on Monday for $142 on the Lower Lakes. So. <laughs> To put things in perspective. Wow. My question actually has to do with the use of the term mining reclamation project area um, on line 1.19. Uh, to my knowledge, that's the first, this is the first time we've used mining reclamation um, to back fill a depleted resource area with property taxes to fund a private development. And um, mine land reclamation is usually used to convert 
uh, depleted resource areas into uh, public spaces, uh, green spaces for the public to uh, participate in and, and benefit from. So could you just make me feel a little bit better about why you're using the term mining reclamation project area? Perhaps I'm Mac or Mr. Casserly or um, who would like to jump in? Uh, uh, Madam Chair, uh, there's no magic in the, in the terminology. Uh, I originally drafted this several years ago and was trying to find uh, a designation to name an area, a project area, uh, because I wanted to distinguish between the project area and what would be a tax increment district. Remember the concept behind this. 25 years ago, we would not have had to come to the legislature to do any of this because these kinds of reclamation projects were considered the same as redevelopment projects. And because that's what we are doing, we are redeveloping a site. And what is going on is to try to bring the site back to a, a, a status where a, the development, will community, development community will come in and do this. This does not assume that you're picking up the normal kinds of special assessment type of costs. There's about $50 million of infrastructure costs in this particular project. There's another $40 million on top of that that the development community has to pay. So what we are looking for assistance with is to try to bring the site to a status that will allow normal development to occur. Uh, without this particular kind of legislation, there will be a little bit and piece of it that will be carved off and some of it will develop and a lot of it will not. It's, it's not worthwhile to do so. So that's the reason that this is here. Uh, there is nothing magic about the name. And, and honestly, I just made up the name because I wanted to designate those parcels that would be defined in a project area to distinguish it from other kinds of project areas. Representative Manzo. Okay, okay Representative Leedling. Well, Madam Chair, I was just going to say that there should be a prize for stumping Mr. Michael because it's such a rare event. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Closing comments, either from Representative Macker or the mayor. Anybody else we want to get to Representative Erdahl, who's come in and out of the room three times. So, Ma Madam Please. Chair, Madam Chair, I will um, make a closing comment. I've been the mayor of Apple Valley for 15 years. We are very judicious about our use of the public resources, and um, if you look at over the past 15 years, I've only been up here, and this is the second year, it's the same, same bill, essentially, for these two, the two bills, the previous one that I spoke to and this one. So we understand what you are saying. We, we want to, breathe, to make sure that we use our, our dollars in the best way, and I think this is a time and an economic challenging time to be able to produce jobs and that's I think essentially what we're doing and the infrastructure that it takes is onerous to a small business owner. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, Madam Mayor. Representative Carlson did you still have a question? Uh, yeah just very quickly uh, Madam Chair I mean that this is a mining <coughs> reclamation or whatever the proper term is. I was curious as to how Maple Grove was being handled, were those TIF districts or not, because that's exactly the same situation. They were mining sites for gravel, and there's huge development that's been going on there for many, many years. And if nobody knows the answer immediately. I think Mr. Michael later. knows yeah. the answer to that one. And before we jump to Representative Bernal, I think Mr. Michael, maybe a holistic question beyond that. You know, these, these are there, these, this one, Maple Grove, and others are coming, have, have come in the past, are being considered. In fact, the Senate is taking a bigger approach kind of with a statewide bill. And I think the House, um, as I've talked to people bipartisanly, um, feels the industry should pay for these costs, not the property taxpayers. So just putting it out there. But maybe Mr. Michael can um, explain kind of the comparison you just had and what bigger even than those two cities, what folks are contemplating as it relates to who really should bear the cost as these sites convert to other things? Mr. Michael. Um, Madam Chair, Representative Carlson, uh, Representative Zellers has a bill for the Maple Grove area that's similar to the Apple Valley bill. The, I think 
your uh, reflection on the fact that there is a, a fair number of area, a fair amount of area out there that's been developed reflects what Mr. Casserly said, which is depending upon the condition of the land and its location, some of these areas within uh, the general area can develop on their own. And in fact, I think the strategy that Mr. Casserly is employing here is to say, look, we'll define this large project area and we'll take the taxes from those areas uh, that come, the, the incremental taxes from those areas, and then use that to provide infrastructure and other improvements in the rest of the area that would be more difficult to develop. I think what's occurred out in Maple Grove is it's probably, I, I don't honestly know the circumstances, but uh, it's probably a bigger area and it's got, you know, there, every area is different. And so some of that, yes, has developed on its own, but now they're seeking special legislation that's sort of similar to this. But the phenomenon that's going on with all of this is that they take, the, the plan or the strategy is to take the increment from these more attractive, easier to develop places and then use it to help with the other development. I think the policy question that all of you need to face is to what extent should the prior users be paying for these costs in the future anyway, yeah. as opposed to Money. the property taxpayers? And then secondly, is there sort of some limit on this sort of cross-subsidization strategy? And to what extent is the infrastructure that they're putting in here more costly than it would be if this were just a greenfield? Presumably, if somebody's paying for the sort of the putting the land back into a reasonable shape, uh, you know, is there, a pol is there a public policy reason why you should use tax increment to finance this kind of infrastructure as compared with the normal tools that cities use to finance infrastructure outside of the classic redevelopment context? Thank you for that question, Representative Carlson, because I think it really highlights the core policy issue behind not just the MAX bill in particular, many bills, and so that's something we'll all just grapple with as we go forward. And we appreciate you all being here. We're going to lay this over for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill. And Representative Erdahl is here. I'm sorry I didn't see you sitting over there, Representative Erdahl. Um, and so Representative Myra moves House File 823 for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill. And Representative Erdahl, I know you have another committee, so we appreciate that you've been uh, tolerant uh, with us, and, and you've got folks here from Glencoe, I believe. Representative Erdahl, the bill is before us. Thank yes, you. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and uh, members. Um, Madam Chair, we're here to respectfully ask for something special that nobody else gets. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> we like that honesty. <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, the, uh, the City of Glencoe requests the extension of a, uh, a tax increment district number four uh, through 2023 uh, to continue to fund pool debt service obligations with TID number 14 and number 15. If development opportunities in TID 14 and 15 generate additional tax in increments in the future, uh, TID number four will be de decertified earlier than 2023. I have with me the uh, Mayor of Glencoe, Mr. Randy Wilson, and uh, Councilman uh, Mr. Pershaw. Great, Mayor Wilson, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, obviously, you're talking a lot about tax increment districts, and you certainly understand them. And we are asking for special legislation. Um, so you know, though, we have followed the rules. We've had 16 districts since the early 70s. We have decertified 12 of them. And technically, had it not been for a little downturn in the economy, we wouldn't be asking for this extension. Um, we are asking for an extension for another 10 years of the tax increment district that was started in the 80s that is an industrial park. Our last two districts, 14 and 15, we did, um, one is in downtown, we redeveloped some blighted areas, and the 15 is a new industrial park. Um, our other one is filled out entirely. And I'll give you an idea, we have Midwest Porcine that sells um, tissues from hogs all through the nation in there, and we have Merrill Matrix Medical. So in fact, it, it has been a good process, a good thing for us to have this tax increment district. And we are asking for the legislation. And you, you know, one thing you talked about a little bit is that you know, maybe we don't need these, but I'll, I'll just give you an idea. If we don't extend it, 
the, the dollars that we will need to shore up the shortfall in districts 14 and 15 will come from districts that we would like to use for road and street repair, which is something we have not done as much because of local government aid. We've kind of put that on the back burner. So while it does seem easy to say, well, they don't need that, the reality is many times we do because instead of a $2.3 million street overlay and those types, we will need to take and pay those others out of those same tax dollars. So sometimes there is a give and take. And so while it seems like, oh, you don't need it, sometimes cities do need that. And, and so that's why we're asking you for the extension because uh, we will still stay live within our means in, in this current tax structure we have and the levies we have, and this will allow us to do it and do the street and road repairs. Thank you so much, yes. Mayor Wilson. And you did, would you like to testify as well, please? Uh, <clears throat> Madam Chair, members, Daniel Pershaw, City, Glen, uh, City Council of Glencoe. Uh, I'll just point out that uh, uh, going back to 1976 and 16 of these tax increment districts, this is the only time we've ever asked for an extension. And uh, thank you. appreciate your consideration on this. Thank you for being with us. Is it Council Member Persha? Yes. Is that right? Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, anyone else for or against this bill in the audience would like to testify? Questions for uh, Representative Verdal? Well, we appreciate you being here. We appreciate you being here, Mr. Mayor and Council Member. And I, you probably have the furthest drive of anyone who's okay. testified. So we really appreciate you being here. And we are going to now lay over House File 823 for possible inclusion in the Omnibus Tax Bill. Representative Erdahl? Probable, you said? Mm, possible. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you um, so much. We appreciate it. And we'll lay that over for possible inclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, members, I'm going to quickly refer down to the Property Tax Division, House File 326 Nornas, House File 350 Simon, House File 537 Loon, House File 515 Lean, House File 613 Hansen, 749 Paymar, 904 Murphy, 905 Murphy, 1027 Keel, 1037 Purcell. And those have all been sent down to Division. Members, thanks so much for helping us all get through this. With that, we're adjourned.